You're now going to have the pleasure of hearing from David and Nick Sheff. Uh, rather than me introducing them, I'm going to ask you to turn your eyes to the sc screens and on either side of the room. We have a short video, and then uh, they'll take it from here. So how you doing? I'm doing great, you know, just, um, um, just doing what needs to be done. And, what does oh, that mean? I'm sorry, Dad, um. Why don't we just have lunch and talk? We can do that, right? Mm. Please. You think that you have this under control. I understand why I do things. It doesn't make me any different. You're just embarrassed because I was like, you know, I was like this amazing thing, like your special creation or something, and you don't like who I am now. Yeah, who are you, Nick? This is me, Dad, here, this is who I am. This is not you. This is not you, Nick. What are you doing, huh? You always gotta be controlling everything all the time. Let me, let me book your room no, at a hotel for no, a couple of nights. Dad. I don't want it to go like this. My son has gone missing. Nicholas Sheff, S-H-E-F-F. -F. There's no one by that name, sir. There are moments that I look at him, this kid that I raised, who I thought I knew inside and out, and I wonder who he is. I thought we were close. I thought we were closer than most fathers Wait, and sons. Yeah. Why? I felt better than I ever had, so I just kept on doing it. This oh, isn't God. us. This is not who we just are. My son is out there somewhere, and I don't know what he's doing. I don't know how to help him. You can't. I don't feel like I have a disease. This isn't like cancer. This is my choice. I put myself here. I failed. I can't do it alone. I need to find a way to fill this black hole in me. I still have a family. I want them to be proud of me. What you have, you're gonna find it again. You're gonna get it back. Do you know how much I love you? I love you more than everything. I love everything. 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 I've only seen that once, and it, it's hard to watch. Um, thank you so much for uh, having uh, us here. Um, we, I, I, I just, uh, we were, our, our books were published, uh, I'll talk about it in a minute, and then my son Nick will, uh, a little over 10 years ago, and um, someone approached us uh, about, about doing a movie version, and it was inconceivable. Um, it just sounded, it was too close to home, and it sounded like, it sounded like it would expose us too much, our family too much, and it was just, um, the experience itself was overwhelming, writing about it was overwhelming, and the idea of somebody making a movie about it, but we met these people who uh, approached us, and when we talked to them, we realized that their goal was the same as our goal, which was to show without the cliches that we're used to and without the stereotypes that we're used to, to show what it is to be addicted and to be the family of someone who is addicted. And, um, you know, they, they, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's hard for me to watch um, even the trailer, uh, never mind the movie, because it really captures, if some of the details are different, but it does capture the emotion of what it's like. I think from Nick's perspective, from the, the child's perspective, from the person who becomes addicted, their perspective, it shows in a realistic way what they're going through, and it also shows the hell of being a parent and wanting nothing more than to um, save the life of a child who is on a course that we recognize could uh, kill them. Um, and our hope is that, since we did go forward with these people, our hope is that it will have that impact and it will do a couple things. 
one of them in the middle of this time in our country when addiction is just facing so many of our loved ones and so many of our families, um, hopefully it will affirm the experience to tell people what I didn't know when this began for us, which is that you are not alone. We are not alone. Uh, we think that this is something that happens to other people. And what we learn the hard way is that it can happen to any of us. And the other thing besides affirming the experience of many people, one of the things that most impressed us about the commitment of this, uh, this director and the writers and, and, and the producers was to show that when they got away from the cliches of what it means to be addicted, uh, it was to show we have this idea of what addiction looks like. And we see it from the outside, unless we've been there. And it looks like someone is making choices and they're making appalling choices and they're making immoral choices that are inconceivable to somebody who knows them and who loves them. And one of the things they do in this movie is they show in a very realistic way what I did when this befell our family and Nick was uh, addicted and using and in trouble, um, which was I did a lot of research to understand what was going on with my son because it baffled me so much. And in the course of this research, I came upon professionals, people in this field who taught me that someone who's addicted is not making a choice. It is not a bad choice. No one wants to become addicted. Uh, addiction is a disease and it has characteristics of many other diseases, even though it often doesn't appear to be a disease, but it has um, genetic, uh, psychological, and uh, environmental determinants. Um, and I kind of got it over time. Uh, as you know, the character Timothy Chalamet says you know, in this thing, you know, I, I don't have a disease, I have a cancer is a disease, but what I learned when I looked at the brain images of people who have addiction and they compare them to people who don't, there are startling differences. So we're honored to be here. We are extremely uh, gra gratified and, and grateful that the Colorado Health Foundation, the symposium is, is, is looking at these issues and looking at um, these issues that are plaguing so many of us and so many of our families and also looking at the issues of access because so many people have no access whatsoever to treatment for good health care as we all know. Even harder to get good health care for mental issues, for mental health care is even tougher and addiction is the hardest of all. Uh, I don't have to tell you about the problem in Chicago. I've seen some of the other talks here and uh, the problem has been identified and it's identified in the newspapers all the time. And one thing that's important for us to remember when we talk about the number of people afflicted and we talk about the number of people who die is that it's not only people who die specifically from overdose because of drug use and also the co-occurring mental illnesses, but the lion's share of suicides, car accidents, and many other illnesses are either caused or exacerbated by drugs. And when we go beyond the state, when we look at the national numbers, it's absolutely horrifying. When Nick and I published our books uh, in 2008, uh, I thought it couldn't get worse. Uh, it had to get better at that point. But that year, 36,000 36, people in America died of drug overdoses. Uh, but last year, it was 64,175 people every day. That's eight people every hour. Uh, it's the first time that drug overdose is the leading cause of death in America under the age of, uh, uh, for people under the age of 50. Uh, this, uh, the, I, wrote, I wrote Beautiful Boy and then to sort of understand more, to recognize more, and to, um, to process more, and to explain more about what I learned about this disease, um, I wrote another book, uh, and that it's called Clean, and the subtitle of that book is Overcoming Addiction and Ending America's Greatest Tragedy. And when I published that book, people acknowledged that yes, this is an important problem, and we want to overcome addiction, but America's greatest tragedy, uh, but it is. And the research also confirmed that, because there's no other problem that you can name that causes more devastation. It's behind spiraling healthcare costs, lost productivity, it causes, contributes to crime, 
as I said, suicide, violence, accidents, abuse, and to all the broken families. You'd be hard pressed to find a family that isn't affected by addiction. There are currently 21 million Americans who meet the diagnostic criteria for severe substance use disorders and 40 million more who regularly misuse alcohol and other drugs who are also at risk. But I could cite these statistics all day and they're overwhelming, but they disguise the impact of our drug problem. And that's the suffering. It's the suffering of communities, it's the suffering of individuals and so many families. And uh, I learned this the hard way. Uh, Nick will tell you more when he speaks about his journey and our journey, but I'll focus a little bit on the impact on families themselves because we often do focus, understandably, on the people who are addicted because their drug use could kill them at any moment. So they are in crisis. But what we focus on less often is the impact on families, and families are devastated. It is by far the hardest thing we've ever gone through in our family, and I had a cerebral brain hemorrhage that almost killed me, and this was harder. Um, I uh, watched as my son, my beautiful boy, grew up, and I was, like most parents, I was, first of all, enamored of my son. Uh, he was the light of my life. Uh, and as he grew up, he was this extraordinary person. Uh, all the outside barometers that tell us how our kids are doing showed me that Nick was doing fine. He was doing great. He was a good student. He was an athlete. He was a writer on the school newspaper. And he had a lot of friends. He was just this amazing kid. Um, what I later... What, what later happened, though, is that uh, because of all those external barometers, I forgot, or I didn't know how. It's not that I forgot. I think parents aren't educated to learn how to look deeper uh, at their children, to learn what's going on. And what I learned uh, was that when Nick was about 11 years old, I believe, um, uh, he got high for the first time. He smoked pot, or he drank, I, he'll tell you. Um, and when I found out, I found a bag of pot in his bag and I went to see his teacher and I talked to the school counselor. And at the time they told me what I wanted to hear, which is that, you know, again, Nick's a great kid, he's a good student, he has a lot of friends. Drugs are out there, people experiment, kids, there's peer pressure, Nick's fine, he's going to be fine. What I wish they had said to me and what I know, know in retrospect they should say to me is, that the younger a person tries drugs, the more likely it will be that they will have ultimately a substance use disorder. At 11 years old, the question to ask is not dismissive, not to say it's normal, it's out there, but to ask questions about what is going on in this kid's life that he is using drugs at 11 years old. Um, and what is the most revelation, the biggest revelation to me, what was the biggest revelation was much later when Nick was able to tell me that when he got high for the first time, it wasn't what we think it's about being high. We think kids are out there partying, they're having fun, they just want to, you know, get wasted. It's what their friends are doing. But what Nick says is when he got high for the first time, what he felt was, it wasn't this, you know, euphoria, it was that this absence for the first time in his life of this anxiety that he carried with him. It was then not surprising that he went back for more. I, um, the cycle began when he was 11. His drug use escalated. I continued to be in denial uh, throughout high school. And even when his drug use was clearly problematic, I still listened to other counselors both at schools and even therapists I brought him to who, who minimized it, who said, one of them told me, this guy who was supposedly sort of the best therapist for adolescent boys around us, said to me, listen, again, he said, Nick's a great kid, he's super smart, he, at this point he's going off to college, he just has been working hard in high school, uh, and he feels like, you know, it's a time to party and he's gonna be very serious in college. Uh, by then, Nick was addicted, and of course, I had no idea. Um, and we should have, if we only had known then and begun to intervene, maybe we could have prevented what happened. And what happened was uh, a succession of catastrophes, tragedies, increased drug use, overdose over and over again. And then, as I said, the impact on our family. I'm gonna read very briefly from Beautiful Boy. 
One windy day in May, our young children, Nick's younger brother and sister, Daisy and Jasper, who were then eight and five years old, spent the morning cutting and pasting and coloring notes and welcome home banners for their brother. They had not seen Nick, who was arriving home from college for the summer in six months. In the afternoon, we drove to the airport to pick him up. At home, in uh, north of San Francisco, Nick, who was then 19, lugged his duffel bag and backpack into his old bedroom. He unpacked and emerged with his arms loaded with gifts. He brought a super soaker for Jasper, for Daisy, an American girl doll. They played throughout the afternoon. We had dinner when it was bedtime. They asked if Nick would read to them, and he did. He read The Witches by Roald Dahl. We heard voices from the other room. Nick's voices, the boy narrator, all wonder and earnestness, wry and creaky grandmother and the shrieking, haggy grand high witch. His performance was irresistible and the children were riveted. He was a playful and affectionate big brother to Daisy and Jasper when he wasn't high. Late that night, I heard the creaking of bending tree branches. I also heard Nick padding along the hallway, making tea in the kitchen, quietly strumming his guitar. I worried about his insomnia, but pushed away my suspicions, instead reminding myself how far he had come some, since the previous school year when he dropped out of uh, Berkeley. This time, he had gone east to college, made it through his freshman year. Given what we know, been through, this felt miraculous. As far as we know, he was coming up on his sixth month off methamphetamine. In the morning, Nick, in flannel pajamas, bottoms, and graying wool and sweater, shuffled in the kitchen. His skin was rice papery and gaunt. His hair was like a field with smashed down sienna patches and sticking up yellow clumps, a leftover from when he tried to bleach it. He hovered over the kitchen counter, making an espresso, filling it with water, and then sat down to a bowl of cereal with Daisy and Jasper. I stared hard at him. The giveaway was his vibrating body, idling like a car, his jaw gyrating, his eyes were darting opals. He made, pl he made plans with the kids for after school and gave them hugs. When they were gone, I said to him, I know you're using again. He glared at me. What are you talking about? I'm not. His eyes fixed onto the floor. Then you won't mind being drug tested. Whatever. When Dick next emerged from his bedroom, head down, his backpack was slung over his back. He held his electric guitar by the neck. He left the house, slamming the door behind him. Late that afternoon, Jasper and Daisy burst in, dashing from room to room, before finally stopping and looking up at me and asking, where's Nick? It was the first time of many times that Nick disappeared. Every time, it was the same. I called his friends, their parents, hospitals. Maybe there'd been an accident. I called the police. Maybe he'd been arrested. Once I called the local sheriff's office. He'd heard my voice so many times, he said, Mr. Schaff, have you tried the morgue? Nick was gone, sometimes for a day, sometimes for two. I didn't sleep. I imagined the worst scenarios. Karen and I, my wife Karen and I, carried on as normally as we could, trying to take care of the other children, but we were consumed with worry. Nick called. He told me where he was this first time. I went to get him. He was in an alley behind a bookstore near where we live, and he looked terrible. Emaciated, shaking, he could barely stand. My denial was gone then. I knew he had to get him help or he was going to die. I got him home into bed, got him on the phone. And that's when I got my first glimpse of what we call an addiction care system in America. 90% of people who need help never receive it. People are, with substance use disorders are more likely to wind up in prison than in rehab. Those who do get treatment and are a broken system that's almost impossible to navigate. We're immobilized by fear and anxiety, and yet in this compromised state, we must make one of the most complex and important decisions of our lives. Since there's no trustworthy system, we seek advice from school counselors, teachers, social workers, clergy, friends, friends of friends. If we're facing other diseases, we would know what to do. We'd go to the doctor. But few doctors have been trained to recognize problems in their patients, and few still know how to treat them. Or even if they recognize a drug problem, they don't know where to refer someone who needs help. Many of us go online, but the web is a repository of misinformation and lies. Many people recommend rehab, but what is rehab? There's no standard definition. Some rehabs employ threats and harsh and humiliating punishments. 
Some are run by self-anointed experts, so supposedly, but they have no training or credentials. In many states, anyone can open a rehab. People in need become increasingly disillusioned and skeptical, distrustful, because the system is a haphazard collection of hobbled, hobbled together, often useless, sometimes harmful programs. That first time I had to do something, I called dozens of programs. I was quoted success rates of 50, 60, 90 percent. One promised, give us your child and $15,000, and we'll return to him drug free in a week. I was humbled when I talked to the priest who ran San Francisco's St. Anthony's, a social service foundation with an addiction recovery program. He spoke honestly. Success for us, he said, is that a person hasn't died. We ended up choosing a program haphazardly, randomly. They took our insurance. It was recommended by a friend of a friend. It had an open bed. It was a 28-day program. When I dropped Nick off, I was devastated. I got back in the car and I wept. But I thought, this has been hell, but he's safe, and I'll pick him up in a month and he'll be cured. But of course, that's not what happened. He quickly relapsed, left home again, time and time again, year after year after year. Every time I thought it could, couldn't get worse, it did. I kept making those phone calls to the emergency rooms and to the police, and I got some too. A doctor calling in the middle of the night, Mr. Chef, we have your son, you'd better get down here. We don't know if he's going to make it. Another time, another ER doctor telling me he might have to amputate Nick's arm because it had become infected because of uh, intravenous drug use. That was the first time I used, I learned that Nick actually was mainlining drugs. As I wrote, my son was shooting poison into his arms, arms that not that long ago through baseballs and built Lego castles, arms that wrapped around my neck when I carried a sleepy body in from the car at night. Eventually, however, after years of this, after rehab, after rehab, outpatient programs, inpatient programs, sober living houses, various kinds of therapists, eventually Nick was sober for a year, then a year and a half, and it felt like a miracle. And with him in recovery, um, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer, that's what I do. I sort of say, make sense of my life and what happens in my life through writing. Uh, and I felt at this point that there would be a service in telling our story uh, so people would be educated in a way that I wasn't. Yes, this can happen to you. Uh, it could happen to anyone. I talked to Nick to make sure he was comfortable with this. I talked to my wife. I talked to Nick's mom. And so I wrote an article that appeared in the New York Times Magazine. Um, and when it published, I, that's when I really understood the ubiquity of this problem. I learned that it affects people regardless of their socioeconomics, education, race, geography. And I learned more about the pain caused and about the stigma that immeasurably worsens the suffering. When I met countless people whose lives have been shattered, I also learned something else, which is something that I could not have imagined when we were in the worst of it. I learned that no matter how bad it had gotten for us, we were the lucky ones. I learned this over and over again when I heard from parents and others who would say, how did you get into our house? You told our story. You told your story is our story, but ours had a different ending. My lovely daughter didn't make it. My beautiful boy died. He was the light of my life. She was my angel child after child who died because they were afflicted with this disease and never got the treatment they needed. At the time, I planned to go back to working on a business book I'd been writing, but, but because of these people, I couldn't. I wanted to understand what was going on. Here was a problem that was devastating families and communities, and almost no one was talking about it. And then when addiction strikes, no one what, knows what to do. And so I set out to learn, and I spent years researching what is addiction? Why is it so, why are we failing so miserably when it comes to preventing it? And why are we failing to treat so many people? The first thing I mentioned, it's maybe the most important thing I learned, is that ad addiction, compared to almost every other disease, comes with something uh, in such an extreme that it impacts the way we talk about it, the way that we think about it, the way that we share about it, and that is the stigma because 
People think that addiction is a choice, as I said, made by people who are selfish and weak, who choose to get high no matter who it hurts. But it's critical that people understand that it is not a choice, and it's so important. No one chooses to become addicted. Those who do are ill. They have a brain disease. And it is confusing because if people first do choose to use drugs, a disease can't make someone break into, the, into a home. It can't make people do other unconscionable things like Nick did. But as the researcher Tom McClellan explains, it works like this. He said, substance use disorders have the same genetic transmutability as many chronic illnesses. It's a particularly com complex disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. The dysfunction in these circuits have biological, psychological, and behavioral manifestations. Because it's the brain that's affected, motivation, inhibition, and cognition are impaired, which can lead to apparent behavior that appears to be a choice. It's why so many people have a hard time accepting that addiction is a disease. But we need to educate people that it is. And why does it matter? It matters because we punish and judge people who make bad choices. We demand of them confession and contrition. But on the contrary, when people are ill, we treat them with compassion. And the course forward is clearer. People who are ill don't need to be blamed, chastised, or punished. They need the best treatments available. I want to, uh, I'll talk briefly about prevention and treatment, what I learned, uh, and then move on so Nick can talk. Um, of course, prevention is critical with any disease. It's a critical with problems like obesity, heart disease, and many other illnesses. Uh, but it's critically, it's critically, critically uh, important with addiction because 90% of people who become addicted begin using when they're under 18. So if we can prevent use or at least postpone it, we can prevent addiction or potentially lessen the severity and lessen the psychological and physiological problems and also the consequences that are hard to recover from. I learned that effective addiction prevention would include fact-based education, not scare tactics, at improving communication skills between parents, children, caregivers, teachers, and others. The most effective prevention strategies will come when we understand that most drug use isn't about drugs themselves, but about why people use them. Nick talked about the feeling of anxiety that he carried with him for his whole life, his depression. We didn't know, but when Nick got high, they helped. In a survey of thousands of teenagers, teenage, they said that the number one reason they use drugs isn't because they like being high, isn't because of peer pressure, but because of stress. We also know that kids use, that some kids are more likely to use and might more likely to become addicted than others. And they are ones with risk factors that include addiction in their family, those who've suffered trauma, those with conditions like ADHD, learning disabilities, those living in stressful environments characterized by drug use, family dysfunction and violence, and one of the highest risk factors in mental illness. People with untreated mental illness are far, far more likely to use and far more likely to become addicted. We learn this after many, many years when our situation got more and more dire, when we finally brought Nick to a doctor who examined him and told us what we knew by then, that if Nick continued to relapse, that he would die. We had to do something. But he said something else that was contrary to the common message that we heard over and over and over again. We kept hearing people say to us in the treatment community that relapse is a part of recovery. It can be, this doctor said, but we should not accept it as inevitable. Rather, we should assume that there were reasons beyond addiction itself that Nick continued relapsing. He explained that connection between mental illness and addiction. He ordered psychological tests. Nick began working with a psychi psychiatrist who began treating him for bipolar disorder and depression, and he hasn't relapsed since then. We also can mitigate these risk factors by helping kids grow up healthier, safer. We can put systems into place that will help us identify vulnerable kids and intervene early. We can support individuals and families. 
help kids with whatever stress they're, experience, so they're experiencing. No one person or entity can do it alone. To succeed, communities must come together, people must work together, creating an integrated net with which we can catch our kids before they fall. This must include social service organizations, businesses, parents groups, teachers, schools, faith-based groups, law enforcement, politicians, providers of health care, and others. It's complicated. As Steve Shopta, a friend of mine, a psychologist, says, addiction is where science meets people. This is not an easy disease to treat or prevent. But we, just like with prevention, we are thinking about it wrong. We've been thinking for decades about treating addiction wrong. Currently, only one in 10 people who need treatment get any. And of those do, about 80% receive substandard care that's based on an old paradigm, the one I described, that's based on the stigma that addiction is about character, not about illness. We must end practices that are vestiges of the stigmatization. One is the commonly held belief that people who are addicted must hit bottom if he or she will successfully be treated. It's wrong and incredibly dangerous. We don't want people who are ill to hit bottom. Waiting for someone who's addicted to hit bottom before intervening is like waiting to treat a person with diabetes until he loses a leg. It's the opposite of what we want to do. With any disease, we want to intervene as early as we can. It's easier to treat. The damage isn't as severe and the less likely there will be devastating consequences. Many practitioners currently reject scientific evidence. For example, they refuse to, choose to use medication-assisted treatment, including drugs like buprenorphine that are considered now the gold standard of treatment for opioid addictions. A person addicted to opioids on medications like Suboxone are twice as likely to remain sober. In addition, now that methamphetamine use is coming back, uh, rising again, it was, it was diminishing for a long time, but methamphetamine use, cocaine use, uh, there are an arsenal of evidence-based treatments that are almost never, ever offered to people who are ill. I see that the clock is ticking and I want to give Nick time to talk, so I'm going to end here, but I want to end by saying something optimistic, and that is that in spite of the dire circumstances around us, in spite of all of our loved ones that we're losing. There are advances, first of all, in the science of addiction, better treatments. People are becoming addicted. Uh, people are becoming addicted, but also people are becoming trained. Uh, and this includes all medical professionals, not just psychiatrists and psychologists, but uh, general practitioners, pediatricians, who in the past just didn't know what to look for and didn't know what to do if they recognized a problem. Another thing that makes me optimistic is that there is a, that this, it's the only way you can spin this crisis into something that may lead to something positive, which is that for the first time ever, in the past people were ashamed, people who themselves were addicted or their families, so we didn't talk about it, we hid. Uh, this has gotten too big and too bad, we've been losing too many people and people are saying enough. We will no longer hide in the closet and pretend this is not happening. And they have formed groups around the country. They are coming out and they are speaking. They are lobbying their legislators for more support for treatment, for more research, making treatment available for people who have no resources. Uh, and it is having an impact. Things are slowly, 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 slowly uh, improving. And it's improving because of people like you in this room who are doing this important, important life-saving work. And it is with just indescribable, unfathomable thanks that I thank you for what you're doing because you are going to save the lives of so many of our sons and daughters. Very quickly, um, uh, again, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for having Nick here. Thanks for the work you do. Uh, I'd like to ask my son Nick, uh, my beautiful boy, to come up and talk for a little while. Thank you.
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I have to apologize a little bit. I'm a little out of it because I, I didn't realize that this altitude sickness thing was like a real thing, but <laughs> apparently it is, at least for me. So I had a little bit of a rough, rough night, but um, I'm super, super grateful to be here. And um, it's amazing to be here with my dad. And, you know, um, watching that preview for the movie, it's... Um, it's such a crazy thing because I feel like for us, you know, like my dad was saying, our books came out about 10 years ago and, you know, we've traveled around the country and we've talked a lot about our experiences, but um, there's something that is just really different about seeing it on screen with actors, you know, portraying us. And I just feel like, I don't know, ever since I sort of saw the movie for the first time, I've just been so grateful because you know, it's such an amazing reminder of, um, you know, how how tough things were and how far down, you know, I went and how far down our whole, my whole family went and how, um, you know, the fact that we've been able to come back from that and have this really amazing life and, um, you know, really have this amazing relationship, my dad and I and my stepmom and I and my little brother and sister and I, it, it's such a, it's such a miracle, and um, and it gives me a lot of hope. And I hope that um, we can, you know, help to sort of share that message with um, the world. Really, that there is a lot of hope, even you know, if someone has this disease of um, addiction, that you know, it's possible to live a really amazing, full, happy life. And my wife, I uh, got married a couple years ago, and um, actually not just a couple, seven years ago we got married. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been talking now about having kids and stuff, and, you know, the fear is like, well, if, you know, addiction, there is this genetic component, and so, like, what happens if, you know, we have kids and they are addicts, which, you know, I guess there is a percentage of a possibility that they could be. Um, but the thing is, is the thing that I know now is that, like, it's it's not just not a death sentence. It's like... There, it's so possible to live a life beyond anything that I could have, you know, ever imagined. And I see it not just with me, but with all my friends. I mean, I, I, um, I never had any real friends until I got sober. And then suddenly, you know, now I'm surrounded by all these people, you know, who in all different areas of life that do, you know, have all different kinds of interests. Um, and I just see the way their lives get better each and every day as they, you know, stay sober and, and do the work um, to, to just try to, you know, sort of treat this disease and also just come to really, like, as cheesy as it sounds, I guess, like, you know, learn to really, you know, love ourselves and, and, um, and yeah, be really grateful for, for th this amazing life that we have. Um, like my dad said, you know, when I first uh, started doing drugs, I was, I started smoking pot, was when I was um, in sixth grade. And, um, you know, I grew up in Northern California, and just, you know, pot was everywhere, um, as I guess it is in Colorado, too. It just was, um, you know, it was, like, super ubiquitous, and I didn't think that um, it was really that big of a deal, you know, because it was so all over the place. Um, so when, like, a friend of mine came to school, his brother, he had an older brother who was like a pot dealer, um, and he brought some of his brother's pot to school, and he asked if I wanted to smoke it with him. Um, yeah, I didn't really think twice about it, honestly. Um, and so, you know, we went down to the creek after school, and, you know, we smoked pot, and um, really in that moment, I mean, it really was like the feeling that I felt like I'd been missing. Like, I, I felt like up until that point, I just had so much anxiety and I'd been so um, kind of scared and, and I felt uncomfortable in my own skin and it just felt like everyone else around me like had this instruction manual for life that they'd been given that taught them how to like do everything and I had not gotten that. And um, smoking pot, it made me just not care about that anymore and it made me feel like a lot more confident and it took my anxiety away a little bit and um, you know it was really like from that moment on I felt like wow this is something that could really like you know make things better for me and so I um, really actively like tried to do it as much as I could from then on out and it was the same thing when I first 
started drinking, like that feeling was a feeling that I felt like, you know, wow, this is how I wish I always felt, you know, so I could always feel like I was comfortable talking to girls and, and um, you know, being just like settled in my own self or something. And, um, you know, as I went through high school, I just kept reaching out to, to um, drugs and alcohol to try to make myself feel better over and over and over again. And, um, you know, the thing now, I, I really do, like, I, at the time, I really didn't think that there was any other option. And I didn't think that if I were to tell anyone, like, this is how I feel. I feel really anxious. I feel like I don't fit in. I feel like, you know, everyone else was given this instruction manual that I wasn't given. I, I felt like no one would have any solution for that, or they wouldn't understand what I was even talking about. But what I know now is that, like, People, there really are these amazing people out there who are able to help someone when they come to them and say, like, I feel really anxious and I don't know how, and it feels abnormal, like I feel like I don't feel like I'm these, like these other kids that I see, I feel so different from them and I don't know what to do. And I, I do believe that if at that time I'd reached out to people and been honest about how I felt and been able to ask for help, that that help was out there. I just didn't believe it, and I was too, um, you know, too scared to even begin to admit that I felt the way that I was feeling. Um, but the thing with pot, especially, is um, for me because I was doing it so much, and I think I'm also like kind of a depressive person to begin with. And um, pot is a depressant, right? So I was smoking pot all the time, and um, it was making me just even more and more depressed. Um, but then I would try to smoke more pot so I would feel better and then that would make me even more depressed And so it was just this cycle of like all day long from the moment I got up to the moment I went to sleep I was like smoking pot and eventually it just wasn't even really giving me that same feeling of relief that it had before um, And again, you know, I wish that I'd reached out to someone and asked um, and uh, what, You know for help and explained what was going on with me but what I did instead was I, um, I just really tried to find something better. So I, um, you know, tried every drug that was available for me, and um, yeah, it really wasn't until I found um, crystal meth that it was like the one, you know, that I'd been looking for. I guess um, at the time, you know, uh, I didn't know anything about crystal meth. There was no Breaking Bad or. Um, you know, it was before all, all that stuff. So I just had a friend um, that had some speed and he offered it to me and I um, did it. And yeah, I mean, as soon as I did it that first time, it was definitely the feeling I'd been missing my whole life. Like I felt super confident, um, super like a rock star, like I could do anything. And, um, and I really like felt like if I could have just had that feeling my whole life, I would have had this, you know, perfect life because it was like the person I wanted to be, um, at least I thought. But um, as soon as I started doing crystal meth, my life spiraled out of control so quickly. I mean, it just made me totally crazy. I was up for, you know, days and days at a time. I became, you know, this person that I totally wasn't, which was like a, you know, completely unfeeling, uncaring, um, you know, I was st stealing from everybody, you know, I was um, breaking into people's houses to get money, to get more drugs, like I, I really was, um, was uh, it was like unrecognizable to who I had been as a, as a you know, as in my core, like my whole life, I was, I had completely transformed. And, um, you know, I, I ended up going into treatment for the first time. Um, not because I wanted to, and my, like my dad explained, but um, it was sort of this stupid thing where I ended up, I had this drug dealer in the city where um, he had like all these different, you know, every drug that you could imagine. So I got like a big laundry list of drug orders from all my friends and I collected all their money and I went to go um, buy all the drugs from this guy <laughs> and um, I bought them and I stopped at the first person's house to deliver the first batch of these drugs to them. And um, we started doing the drugs. And then, you know, the next thing I knew, I'd done all of them. And um, it was, you know, four days later or something that I came at to out of a 
blackout, and you know, I had no wallet, all, everything, you know, my backpack was gone. I had no idea what I'd been doing for the last four days, and um, I called my dad, and um, you know, I, I just told him I needed help, and um, so yeah, he told that story about how he came and got me, and um, he brought me home, and I fell asleep, and he ended up trying to find a treatment program for me to go into, um, but when I woke up after sleeping it off, you know, um, I did not want to go into treatment at all. Like I felt like, you know, okay, I, that was a mistake, but I'm not going to do that again. Um, but um, you know, so I was really like kind of kicking and screaming when I went into treatment for the first time. But um, you know, my dad was really strong and said, you know, this is not an option. Like you, you know, you either do this or you're you're out on the street. And um, so I, I went to treatment, and like he said, I think I felt like that too, that after 28 days, you know, I was gonna be totally cured, and I was gonna be able to learn how to, you know, be a normal person and not, um, not an addict anymore. Um, and um, that was not what happened. It was sort of the first in like a series of um, treatment centers that, um, you know, I, I I look back on it and I think, you know, there were some places that were really terrible, like my dad said, like, um, you know, places that I went to where if you stepped on the carpet with your shoes on, you had to like scrub the toilets with a toothbrush and I mean, just crazy things. But I think that every place that I went to, I did like learn a little bit more and um, kind of get like little pieces of information. Like I started to think like, okay, maybe this is really a disease. and. Maybe, you know, I, I remember when I went to my first 12-step meeting, I heard a woman speak who was like a middle-aged woman from, um, from, from England. And, you know, I was 19 um, and from San Francisco, and I just thought I was not going to be able to relate to her at all. Um, but the way she talked about alcohol, actually, and the way that she talked about how drinking gave her that feeling of relief, I really did, like, um, connect with that. And I felt like, whoa, maybe that is, maybe I am, like, an alcoholic with alcoholism, um, but for me, the, the thing was is that, um, and I think the reason that I kept relapsing is because, you know, I, I never really had anyone sort of take a look at um, kind of the underlying, like, issues that were going on with me. Like, um, in all that time, you know, I, I never, like my dad was saying, I never was psychologically tested. I never um, was, uh, I was never, even like started on any kind of, you know, um, medication regime of like antidepressants or anything. Um, and so it really wasn't until like years later that a doctor finally um, diagnosed me with bipolar disorder. And, um, you know, when I started taking the medication for that, it, it really helped. I mean, it wasn't like the, you know, the, the, um, the perfect solution, but it did like, you know, I, I think for me, I look at addiction as like, it's kind of like a puzzle and all these pieces come together to make someone an addict. Like, you know, there's the genetic piece, there's the environmental piece, there's the, you know, at what age did someone start using? All these things, they come together to make someone an addict. And I think for me to get sober, it was kind of like a puzzle in that way too, where I had to find all these different pieces of things that were gonna allow me to be able to stay sober and really learn to like love my life as a sober person. And so yeah, medication was one thing. Therapy was another, um, you know, getting into um, the 12-step program was a big thing for me. Um, really just starting to um, do the things that people told me to do and, um, and stop sort of fighting and trying to figure it all out, but just kind of being like, I don't really know what to, I'm doing because my best thinking has gotten me to a point where I'm, you know, 25 and in my sixth rehab or whatever. And so, you know, I just started taking suggestions and um, little by little, I feel like I really did start to um, just really start to um, learn to like, not just accept myself, but like to really love myself for who I am and to really love my life and um, you know I, I think I'm so lucky like I, I know that um, the reason that I'm here and so many of my friends um, that you know I was in treatment with um, have overdosed and died is not because of anything other than just luck I mean I there were so many times where 
I, I almost didn't make it. Um, but, um, you know, the fact that I am alive and that, um, you know, I, I've been able to just really like one day at a time start to put this life together for myself. And, you know, like I said, I'm married now. I have these two dogs that I really care about a lot. Um, you know, we're talking about having kids. You know, I've been um, writing for television um, mostly, which I love. You know, that's been an amazing thing for me. Um, to um, be able to, to sort of work in an area that, that is really exciting and fun for me. And um, yeah, you know, I, I just, but every day, like, you know, I, I talk to my sponsor, I um, go to therapy, you know, twice a month, I go to meetings, like I, I really do all this work all the time and it is work, but it's also like, I don't know, I feel like in a way I wouldn't trade it for anything, so. Um, Anyway, um, I'll stop now, but thank you guys so much, and um, thank you, Dad, too, for being here with me. All right.